So we've been talking about these permutation tests the past couple of classes, and the idea with the permutation test is that some of our assumptions, specifically about our errors, are probably not satisfied. So it's likely that the errors do not fall a normal distribution. And if that is the case, then our t-tests or f-tests are not correct, and we should really think about using something else. And so a permutation test doesn't really assume a specific distribution, but it sets up a test conceptually so that with the idea being that uh, if a predictor or more than one predictor doesn't matter in our model, then we can permute those predictors or we can permute the response. And if in fact there is no relationship between the predictors and the response, then the test statistic you observe should be very similar to the test statistic that we observe when we randomly permute either the response or the predictors, depending on the context. And so we, we decide on some test statistic that uh, seems reasonable for testing our hypothesis in some way. And then we, a, a, whole, a number of times we permute either the response or the predictors. We calculate the same test statistic to get a distribution, uh, a null distribution for our test statistic. And we can calculate a p-value for our test by determining the proportion of test statistics that are as extreme or more extreme than the observed test statistics. And by extremeness, I mean test statistics that are as supportive or more supportive of the alternative hypothesis. So we've done this already when we were, wanted to know whether any of the predictors were, should be included in our regression model. And in that case, we permuted the response variable. However, you can also do a test of a single predictor variable fairly straightforwardly within the permutation test framework. And now instead of doing, instead of permuting the response, we instead permute the predictor variable. And the idea is, is once again that if that predictor has no relationship with the response after accounting for the other predictors in the model, then if we, even if we permute that particular predictor variable, it shouldn't make a whole lot of difference in the results or the test statistic that we end up seeing because there is in fact no relationship between that predictor and the response under the null hypothesis. So let's go back to our, uh, our Santa Cruz data, our, uh, our Galapagos data. And if you remember, we had two predictors in our model that we were considering, the S Cruz predictor and then also the nearest predictor variable. And what we want to test is whether the S Cruz predictor should be in the model when the nearest predictor is included in the model. So our null hypothesis would be that the regression coefficient for nearest is equal to zero, assuming the regression coefficient for S Cruz is not equal to zero. And the alternative is going to be very similar, except that instead of having the nearest predictor equal zero, you would have it not equal to zero. And so that, those are the null and alternative hypotheses, the null and alternative hypothesis that we are trying to test in this particular problem. So let's look at how we would do this in R. So just to remind you of the model that we are going to be fitting here, we are regressing species on nearest and S cruise. So that's our full model, the model that includes the both predictors. And then we take the summary of our linear model and we do that so that we can easily obtain the test statistic, the observed test statistic for our permutation test. And notice that I'm actually using the T statistic in order to test my hypothesis. So even though our null distribution doesn't have a t-distribution now, so in other words, the, the distribution of our test statistic is not going to follow a t-distribution, that's okay, because the t-statistic is still a reasonable test statistic for assessing our hypothesis. We're still assessing whether the estimated regression coefficient uh, is large or is far above zero or far below zero relative to the standard deviation. So our t-statistic is still a reasonable test statistic here we're just not going to calculate our p-value under the assumption that the distribution of our test statistics is a t-distribution. So I obtained my observed test statistic, and then now I'm setting the number of realizations or permutations, so I want 4,000 of those. I'm going to create a vector to store my test statistics in. 
then I'm going to set my number seed for reproducibility. And for each iteration, each of the 4,000 iterations, I am going to regress species on nearest and S cruise predictors. But notice that before I do the regression, I'm actually going to permute the nearest predictor. And so if you remember, the sample function samples without replacement by default, uh, whatever vector you give it. And so this is just going to reorder the values of the nearest predictor. And if, in fact, there is no relationship between the nearest predictor and the species predictor, then we will look at the test statistic, the t-statistic, for the nearest regression coefficient. It should look pretty much the same as any of the other test statistics. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to regress species on a permuted nearest predictor and the s cruz predictor. And then after I do that, I fit, the mo so I fit my model and then I use the summary function uh, so that I can extract the associated t-statistic. So I do that 4,000 times. And then to, in order to assess whether our observed test statistic is large or small compared to the distribution of our test statistics, I'm going to calculate my p-value, and my p-value here is just going to look at the proportion of test statistics in absolute value that are greater than or equal to my observed test statistic, uh, and also an absolute value. Because in this case, I want to assess, this is a two-cell test, basically, and this is a way of determining all the, test, the proportion of test statistics that are more extreme in either the positive or negative direction. So I calculate that. And it looks like my IP value is about 0.1145. So that's not real extreme evidence for the alternative hypothesis. So, uh, and actually it's, below, it's above 0.1, which is usually the largest significance level that people test at. And so based on that, based on the fact that our P value was 0 0.1145, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the nearest predictor has no relationship with the species response after accounting for the S cruise predictor. Or another way of saying that is when already accounting for the effect of the S cruise predictor, there is insufficient evidence to conclude that the nearest predictor substantially aids in modeling the number of species of tortoise. So if you remember the, or maybe it was turtle, turtle or tortoise. But if you remember the species was the number of turtle or tortoises on these Galapagos Islands. And after we account for the S cruise predictor, after we already have that in our model, it doesn't appear that the nearest predictor is needed. So in other words, we still have to reject the null hypothesis that the regression coefficient for nearest is equal to zero. So uh, actually, in both of the two permutation tests that we just did, we actually got pretty similar results. Uh, the p-values, the test statistics, well, I guess the p-values pretty much look the same uh, in both tests. So that was good. That gives us more confidence that, in fact, uh, that our results are correct or at least consistent. Um, they're not really susceptible to the assumptions that we're making. But if there is a discrepancy, so if you're not, if you see a big discrepancy between the p-value for your test under the assumption of normal errors and the p-value that you get from a permutation test, unless you're really, really confident that the errors do in fact follow a normal distribution, then you probably want to go with the results of the permutation test, simply because it makes fewer assumptions. And so it's a little more, more robust, a little bit easier to defend the results uh, in comparison with the test that assumes that we have normal errors. So, and one of the nice things about permutation tests is that even when we don't have a random sample of data and we can't extend our results from our sample to our population, uh, you can act, they actually work very, very well when you're doing an experiment. Uh, 
Um, so you can essentially permute the response and, and ask if there is in fact no relationship between our treatments, for example, and our response, then we could just randomly permute the responses among the treatments and we shouldn't get any different results. And so it's really easy to justify a permutation-based procedure when you're doing a randomized experiment uh, and in order to conclude your results. So that's a, another reason to use a permutation test when you're not sure whether the errors are normal or not.